In the years following World War I, the emerging airline industry desperately needed planes to move passengers and cargo safely and rapidly to distant parts of the world. This, the Junkers F-13, was one of those first truly modern commercial aircraft, and it would go on to pioneer many of the airlines and airliners that we depend on today. Throughout history, some machines are regarded as great. Their pioneering innovation, groundbreaking performance, market-leading success or battlefield glory have made them legends and they have gone on to be enshrined in the history books. This is not their story. These, instead, are the stories of the forgotten many. The failed designs, sales flops and occasional unsung heroes that have become the yardstick against which the legends are compared. Yet they deserve to be so much more than that, for in their own unique way, they are parts of history. The story of the F-13 and how it revolutionised air travel starts with Hugo Junkers. Junkers was an engineer based in Dessau, Germany, whose company started out making boilers, engines and other industrial equipment. In 1908, though, Junkers was approached by Hans Reisner, an aeronautics engineer who had plans to build a revolutionary new kind of aircraft. The aircraft, which would be known as the Reisner Enter, would be constructed out of metal, a radical notion for the time, especially since aviation as an industry was only about five years old. Nevertheless, Junkers was willing to get involved and to help Reisner turn his dream into reality. The Enter made its first flight in 1912, becoming the first all-metal aircraft to successfully do so, and then, well, it seems to have drifted into obscurity. However, this aircraft evidently piqued Hugo Junkers' interest in aviation, as three years later, his company designed and built its own all-metal aircraft, the Junkers J-1. Although it was regarded as one of the first practical all-metal aircraft, the J-1 didn't end up winning any orders from the newly formed Imperial German Air Force. But that didn't stop Junkers. In 1917, the company finally won a production order, the first ever for an all-metal aircraft, with their J-4 armoured attack monoplane, confusingly designated the J-1 by the German military. More innovative designs followed in 1918, like the Junkers D-1, the first metal fighter aircraft, and the CL-1, a two-seat reconnaissance and support plane. Unfortunately, before Junkers' metal marvels could conquer the skies, World War I ended with the surrender of Germany. With the war over, the German Air Force outlawed, and Junkers forbidden from building military planes under the Treaty of Versailles, the company had to put their wartime experience to a different use. They decided to use the advanced all-metal monoplane designs developed during the war to form the basis for a civilian airliner that would be far ahead of the wood and canvas biplanes that were then the mainstays of the world's airlines. This, the Junkers F-13, was the realisation of their efforts. With its distinctive corrugated aluminium skin and low-mounted cantilever wing, it was quite clearly a Junkers product, and an obvious evolution of the firm's wartime designs. Unlike those military planes though, the F-13 had been designed from the outset to be a commercial aircraft. It had an enclosed cabin with space for four passengers, who could enjoy heating and padded seats fitted with seat belts, which were a rarity at the time. A fifth passenger could be carried next to the pilot in the open cockpit up front, which did have a roof of sorts, but lacked the protection of a full windscreen or side windows. Though the brick-like F-13 might not look particularly aerodynamic today, back in the 1920s, it was considered revolutionary. That's because, unlike most other aircraft of the era, its struts and bracing wires weren't hanging out in the airstream, but were concealed neatly inside the wing. Not only did this make the airframe cleaner, 
but the internal bracing working with the corrugated skin produced a rigid and very strong structure. The F-13s were available with a variety of different engines, including inline power plants made by Mercedes, BMW, Armstrong Siddeley and Junkers themselves, or air-cooled radial engines like the Gnome Rhone Jupiter. There were also different sizes of wing, and options for shorter or longer fuselages, which gave the F-13 an incredible 24 variants all told. Aside from the Junkers factory in Dessau, the aircraft was also produced under license in the United States as the Junkers Larsen JL-6, as well as in the Soviet Union, where it was known as the JU-13. During the period between 1921 to 1923, when the Allies banned aircraft production of any kind in Germany, Junkers established factories in Estonia and the free city of Danzig, now Gdansk in Poland, to keep supplying F-13s to the growing airlines. When the F-13 first flew on the 25th of June 1919, a new era began for civil aviation. Junkers' plane was the first airliner ever to be made entirely of metal, and one of very few commercial monoplanes on the market at the time. However, the advanced F-13 would be up against stiff competition. Junkers, being a German company, was subjected to severe Allied scrutiny, and hampered by the damage done to German aviation by the war and subsequent economic hardships. Not only that, but aircraft manufacturers in general had to contend with the truly huge volumes of surplus military planes, converted to carry passengers and being offered cheaply on the commercial market. If Junkers F-13 was to succeed, the company would have to work hard to sell it to the growing industry. They offered leasing options and provided aircraft on loan to get the F-13 into the hands of European carriers, and even started their own airline, Junkers Luftwerke, in 1920 to show off their product. Not only was the F-13 successful in service, but Junkers airline eventually became the second largest carrier in Germany by 1926, when it was merged into its competitor, Deutsche Lufthansa. As the 1920s progressed, Junkers sales tactics and the F-13's advanced and rugged design were proving themselves to be successful, and the company's order book was expanding rapidly, not just in Europe, but all across the world. The F-13's toughness and adaptability, along with a good safety record for the time, appealed to airlines around the world, from South America to Scandinavia, Asia to Africa, and pretty much everywhere in between, where the need for dependable aircraft to provide air service was critical. It wasn't like these F-13s were in for an easy life either. In the early days of the airline industry, the huge maintenance infrastructure, strictly regulated checks and legions of highly qualified engineers and mechanics simply didn't exist. In many places, neither did proper runways. In order to be successful, airliners had to be reliable, versatile and very well made. Fortunately, the F-13 soon proved it was up to the task. Some aircraft were reported to have spent several months stored outside of a hangar in harsh northern European winters, and survived without detriment. Others lasted for years in the jungles of South America, and proved relatively immune to the termites and humidity that caused wooden aircraft to deteriorate. Not only was the F-13 tough, it was also adaptable and easy to maintain. The cabin could easily be reconfigured, the wheeled landing gear substituted for skis or floats depending on the needs of the operator, and large access panels enabled easy repairs to engine and airframe. In fact, the F-13's wing sections could be removed or mounted by two mechanics in only a few minutes. Junkers' strong all-metal airframe and the F-13's thoughtful design and quality construction were critical to the success of the early airlines, who needed to keep their aircraft in the air as long as possible to stay in business. In fact, the Junkers F-13 was the first aircraft operated by airlines that would go on to be large global carriers, such as Austrian Airlines in 1923, LAB Lloyd Aero Boliviano 1925, Avianca 
1920. Finnair, 1923. LOT Polish Airlines, 1922. Swissair, 1919. SAS, 1924. And, as previously mentioned, half of Lufthansa. Apart from airline service, some F-13s were used by military forces as transports and bombers, particularly by the air forces of Colombia, Mexico, Finland and China. The aircraft saw combat in the Colombia-Peru War of 1932-33, where Colombian F-13s were used as bombers, and the 1932 attack on Shanghai, where the Chinese F-13s, along with the Shanghai Aircraft Factory, were unfortunately destroyed by Imperial Japanese forces. However, while the F-13 had shown that Junkers metal monoplanes were reliable and helped to build the world's airlines, its small size and limited payload, only 689 kilograms, meant that it simply couldn't keep up with the rapid growth in the industry it had helped to create. Production ended in 1932, by which point some 322 planes had been sold, quite a large number for an airliner of that era. More importantly, the F-13 had shown the way forward for airliners, and for Junkers. The company followed the F-13 with the W-33 and W-34, which built upon and refined the F-13 design to provide greater capacity and improved flight characteristics. These aircraft would also carry on the F-13's trailblazing reputation, with the W-33 being the first aircraft to fly the Atlantic from east to west, going from Ireland to Canada in 1928, and a prototype W-34 breaking the world altitude record in 1929 at 41,800 feet. They also enjoyed commercial success, with 199 W-33s being made, and over a thousand W-34s, with some figures stating a thousand aircraft being built for civilian users, plus another two thousand being built as trainers and transport planes for the Luftwaffe. Despite being superseded, the F-13 still provided reliable service for years. The last operational F-13 was retired in Brazil in 1951, more than 30 years after the airliner's first flight in 1919, and a full 19 years after the last F-13 was made. Well, the last F-13 built by Junkers, that is, because in 2009, a German-Swiss company decided to bring the F-13 back. See, the F-13's historic significance and distinctive looks inspired Dieter Morschek, enthusiastic pilot and CEO of high-end luggage company Rimowa, to create a replica F-13 in 2009, and I don't mean a scale model like the one on the table. Morzhek set up a new division of Rimowa to not just make a flying replica of the F-13, but to actually restart production of the aircraft. The new company, initially called Rimowa Junkers, but later renamed simply to Junkers Flugzeugwerke, spent seven years studying historic documents examining preserved F-13s, and hand-constructing their first plane, which flew in September 2016. Their aircraft features modern instruments and safety devices, and is powered by a Pratt & Whitney Wasp Jr. radial engine, but is structurally almost identical to the Junkers Larsen JL-6, a variant of the original F-13 built under license in the USA. Rimowa Junkers went on to build a further three F-13s, priced at about two and a half million US dollars per aircraft, between 2016 and 2019, when, from what I could find, they switched to producing a replica of the Junkers A-50 Junior, a single-seat sports aircraft. But let's go back to the F-13 to wrap this up. Sure, it might not be as famous as airliners like the DC-3 or Concorde, and yes, today it might seem like just a tiny four-seat airplane, with no brakes, an open cockpit, and all the aesthetic appeal of a flying garden shed. However, if not for the Junkers F-13, the civil aviation industry we know today might well be very different. The F-13 introduced the world to the all-metal airliner, 
and was one of the first mass-produced aircraft to be made out of aluminium, now a critical material in aircraft construction. Not only that, but the F-13's versatile and tough design made it a crucial asset for the up-and-coming airlines, particularly in places where more fragile wooden aircraft simply couldn't survive the punishing environment and primitive, sometimes non-existent, infrastructure. The little Junkers F-13 brought reliable and relatively comfortable and safe air service to Northern Europe, South America and Asia, in countries that had long struggled to connect towns separated by impassable mountain ranges, lakes, forests or all of those at once. It operated the first flights for airlines that would go on to connect the globe and proved that Hans Reisner's concept for an all-metal aircraft and Hugo Junker's innovative aluminium construction techniques were viable for commercial airliners. The Junkers F-13 was and is an important part of history and despite being a bit of an unsung hero compared to other airliners, still continues to inspire aviation enthusiasts and make its influence felt in aircraft designs today.